This podcast is brought to you by the Prospect Research Institute, where researchers come to learn, innovate, and connect. It sounds kind of obvious and basic, but like really the way to convince an investor is to do the work to be first and foremost, fully convinced yourself that you're telling investors about the truth about this opportunity. Welcome to Prospect Research Chat Bites, a podcast by and for prospect research professionals. I'm Jennifer Filla. Today, I'm talking with Gori Manglick, CEO and co-founder at Instrumental. Hello, Gari. Thank you for joining me today on Chat Bites. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So before we jump into our topic of fundraising abundance today, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share a little bit about your career journey, which has been very interesting, and then a little bit about how and why you founded Instrumental. Yeah, so I went to college, and prior to college, my main career aspiration was to become a basketball player. And then somewhere along the way, I realized that wasn't happening. So I got to college and I was like, well, what should I study? I kind of explored a bunch of different things. I tried a computer science class and I ended up being, you know, decently good at it. Um, So then I just kept going with that kind of just totally at chance. My last semester senior year, there was an entrepreneurship class happening in the, in the kind of business school. And I like immediately was like, I have to take this class and I took that class and actually started a company out of that class. And that was my first company. And I worked on that after graduating. And what was really cool about how that class worked out is that there was a bunch of other people that had also joined from the computer science department into that business school class. And we somehow all found each other and actually built, like that was our team. It was like mostly people that could like build a product. So I feel like there was a lot of um, luck there where we actually could like build a product and get more traction during that class because we happened to have a team of folks um, that could do that. So I started a company um, from that class in, in the consumer mobile space. Um, that was like when, you know, building a new app for your iPhone was like all the rage. And so we built a, a, an app that was um, helpful for, for folks to find where to go based on where their friends have gone. It was called Fondue. And we worked on that for a bit over two years. And then um, we ended up going through an acquisition with Airbnb. And so I moved out to the West Coast from New York, moved out to the Bay Area, worked at Airbnb for a couple of years. I had a really exciting time in that company's journey, got to work on their mobile apps and a couple of special projects there. And then while I was at Airbnb, I met my co-founder, who is also now my wife, Angela. I met her personally, and she was working on, on a company called Instrumental, and I was kind of advising her. And I just generally always thought of myself as a startup person, as an entrepreneur. And so even while I was at Airbnb, I was like kind of ready and looking for the next thing that I would be working on as a founder myself. And so it ended up being really great kind of serendipity that I met Angela and she also was the person that I ended up starting this company with. And the the first version of Instrumental was totally different than what it is today. It was a crowdfunding platform for female scientists. And then eventually we kind of went through a lot of iterations and built what we have today, which is a SaaS platform for nonprofits. But as I was looking at the space, both in academia as well as the nonprofit space, I felt like there was a lot of like product and customer obsession that I really saw in the in the product, in the for-profit like startup space, the for-profit like tech landscape, but I wasn't seeing much of that in the nonprofit tech space. So when Angela kind of opened, you know, my eyes to this new this new world, it was really exciting for me to like bring my background in like product and technology to a space that I felt like I was gonna have even more impact. Gosh, that was in 2015 that you started instrumental yeah that's when angela got started and you know with that crowdfunding platform for female scientists and then i would say at the end of 20 or at the beginning of 2019 is really when we started to really focus on this this what we have today that's so interesting that you say that because i feel like we've had an explosion of tech companies focused on the nonprofit space in the past you know three to five years but not in foundations There hasn't been any innovation there in a really long time. So interesting that you found that niche within a niche. That's crazy. Yeah, like a particularly underserved um, space, I would say. Absolutely. That brings us into our topic. From your background in startups, including both of your own, you've had success right out of the gate, which is crazy wild. It's a good testament to uh, your drive and to your education. And then, and I guess your social skills too, you found the group of people. I think that interconnectivity is almost as important as anything else 
in tech. We don't get enough of it. One thing that I wondered, I know that there are some of these tech startups, they just blow through that investment cash and then they either get more or they blow up. You know, mm-hmm. they, they aren't getting that sustainable progress in term of product you know, or outcome, whatever they're trying to do. And then there are those who have abundance like yourself and you do grow sustainably and keep iterating. You keep looking into your market, understanding things better, making a better product, figuring out how to position yourself. So what's the difference? How do we get one and not the other and vice versa? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. When I think about an abundance mindset, you know, what comes to mind is like, you know, having a mindset where there are more options, more choices, more resources, like plenty of resources to go around for everyone. And I think how that translates into building a startup is interesting. And I also think, you know, there's some kind of parallel themes there with uh, with the nonprofit world as well. One of the things that comes to mind is this realization that you can create like win-win situations, especially when it comes to fundraising in the for-profit space, not even talking about the nonprofit space, but there's this common kind of feeling that a lot of startups will have when they're just getting started where you know as soon as they have an idea they're like okay I got to go out there and like convince some investors to give me some money so that I can actually work on this thing or so that I can be the next big thing it's this idea of like convincing investors we went through this startup accelerator called Y Combinator and the founder of Y Combinator Paul Graham has a lot of really great essays and one of the things he talks about is it sounds kind of obvious and basic but like really the way to convince an investor is to do the work to be first and foremost fully convinced convince yourself that you're telling investors about the truth about this opportunity. And to do the work to be convinced yourself, it's not easy. You have to make sure that you're making something people want. You might want to see some initial traction. Uh, You might need to get a product out there and like go through a couple of iterations until you're finding something that's easy to sell. You need to understand the landscape of other options that are out there and make sure that you truly have a differentiator and an insight so that when you're speaking to investors, you can share that. And if you don't have those things, then you may not actually be convinced and you're kind of jumping the gun going to like, how do I convince investors without kind of laying that uh, groundwork yourself. And I think there's an interesting corollary there in the, in the in the nonprofit space as well. The other thing that I think about in the for-profit tech space in general is this site with an abundance mindset, focusing on your strengths instead of your weaknesses. Like what are your actual superpowers and differentiators? You can't do everything. You can't do everything well. And so being okay with that and, and saying like, you know, there's something that I am really good at and I'm going to focus my efforts, concentrate my efforts on what I'm going to be able to do uniquely well so I can have something differentiated to offer the market, I think is also what comes to mind. Very interesting. And I was speaking to a nonprofit the other day. She has a small shop, but they're, they've are they like sort of franchised their operations, whatever the nonprofit version of that is called. So although they have this big success or, or a big reach across the country, they still have a small fundraising shop in the headquarters and their board is pushing them to do prospect research. But they had done the work to look into their market, to look into their donors and the work on reading the studies about what resonates with donors and their particular cause, at least the way they see their cause was not what potential donors wanted to hear about. And it had to do with homelessness and the the many different aspects of homelessness. And it's so interesting to hear you talk about the fundraising and the for-profit and convincing because they're still in homelessness, right? I mean, they don't have to lie to potential donors to touch on the key points affecting all kinds of homelessness. Maybe not their particular beneficiaries of their program, but it it really strikes me that that's what was happening with her when she was talking to me to convince me about the need for prospect research at her organization. I was sensing just get really good at talking to your donors because if you can't do it for someone who's going to give you $25, how are you going to do it when you ask for a million? You know, how are you going to convince them to part with a million dollars when you're struggling at 25 or 50 or a hundred? Mm-hmm. And I, I often hear nonprofits also say, yes, but we don't have children or puppies. So what is their superpower? I mean, I hear a lot of stuff in the nonprofit space about trying to convince donors, and it didn't occur to me that there would be a parallel in the for-profit. Yeah, you want, I feel like you want to get to a place where you can kind of outline a case for why funding you should be a no-brainer, right? Like donors, there's hundreds of billions of dollars that 
are going out there and you could you could look at it from one perspective which is like yeah it's like altruistic and so and then if you look at it that way then you're kind then you do feel like you need to kind of convince or beg because you're just it's just altruism and i feel like another way to look at it is like actually these donors and these funders they have a problem they're trying to solve they want an outcome they want some sort of change in the world they're not going to work on it themselves and like you're you know you're the kind of steward of of that money and and, and the way that that impact gets created so if you kind of to kind of shift the framework again to like have to kind of change that power dynamic in your mind where I feel like you, you could get to a place and it's hard. There's a lot of upfront work to do this. And I know there's a chicken and egg problem with like, you know, having the funding to be able to create the outcomes and all of that. But just like having that mindset shift might open up some new opportunities of like how you can actually lay your case for why funding you is actually a no brainer for the funder or the donor and actually why it's solving a key problem for them. In our digital world now, there's so many templates and webinars and stuff like that. And sometimes, even though we talk about case for support, what I'm hearing from how you've been operating in the startup world is it's not filling out a template. Like all that work you talk about is the work on, let me talk to some donors. Let me look at the studies that are already done. And let me think about what we do and talk to our program people and find out well, what's really important to our donors and how do we communicate that in their language. So it's not, I'm not lying. I'm not making it up. I'm not overlooking some critical aspect of our cause. I'm changing the language that I'm speaking to be for my donors. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. I think the that looking at those templates can be a great way to like really understand the mind of a donor and the funder, right? Like to build your intuition of like what they're looking for, what 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 how they see the problems that they're trying to solve so that when you're putting together that win-win kind of scenario for them, like you really have all the information about what what they could how they could be looking at it. So getting to foundation work or foundation fundraising, which is what you're serving with Instrumental right now. I had done corporate and foundation relations work years ago. And at that time, I don't know, I feel like fundraising is, a, is an established profession. There are best practices, but there really, at that time, especially wasn't software to help with the process of foundation fundraising. And typically we look to our CRMs for that. You know, if, if you look at a CRM now, it has that customer relationship management stuff in it, like the moves that you have to make. And at the time, and the software is still around, this database software, it really did not support foundation fundraising. And the VP at the time would mimic that not supporting. So we would have our prospect strategy meetings, which were new. So everyone would come to the table, including corporate and foundation relations. And I would get asked the same question about the same open proposals. You know, when is this going to close? Well, when the board meets, they tell me when the board is going to meet. No. Did they say I could contact them? No. <laughs> you know, like we don't know when that's going to happen. And the structure within the database, of course, was looking for a close date like that. You know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't allowing for the different types of moves that you make in with foundations. I mean, depending on the type of foundation. I'm curious. I don't think much of anything has changed in terms of database support for that. And then the tools that we have, I guess I never expected more from the search tools. Like when I'm searching for opportunities with foundations, but clearly you and Angela have looked at it differently. And if I understand what I saw on the website, Instrumental helps support the prospecting all the way through to the grant writing and the closing. Is that mm -hmm. true? Yeah, we do. Our goal is to be an end-to-end -end institutional fundraising platform that does everything from discovery to helping you uncover those new opportunities to your research to help prioritize those opportunities and funders effectively to managing your grant calendar collaboration and reporting and even tracking that kind of post-award work that you need to do. And we totally recognize that a lot of, most of our nonprofits are also working with a CRM at the organization that tends to have all of the data around individual donors. And we also recognize that that CRM is most of the time not set up for success to help with the institutional funders. And so we're actually working on integrations now to have Instrumental be the place where you can live in as an institutional fundraiser and just kind of not really worry about that data needing to be synced with your CRM. Because Instrumental is designed for grants, for institutional funders, when you, people use it, I see their eyes light up and they're like, oh my God, finally, like 
a tool that's actually meant for for this type of data. There's just like an inherent difference in the data that you need to track and store with institutional funders and individual donors. And if you think about a CRM, it's, it's just hard for them to, if they want to be a really good CRM for individual donors, it's going to naturally make it hard for them to also support the institutional funders use case. And so Instrumental is kind of bridging that gap. Yeah, I totally remember building these Excel lists of foundation funding. And at that time, it was a hospital and university setting. And I was tasked with finding foundation support for research funding. You know, when they were not getting the NIH grant, they were then coming to us. Can we get some private funding? And it was complicated and, and frustrating because this was in cancer, cancer research. And trying to track like, okay, when are the deadlines? How am I going to know to try to find a match with a researcher before that deadline? Yeah, I was trying to come up with a better way of finding any foundation that wanted to fund cancer-related stuff, maybe even before the researcher came to me. So it was it was very challenging. It was fun. I enjoyed it. And we had some success uh, with private funding. I just remember that being such a challenge because you don't want to put those prospects into the CRM until you intend to do something with them. But in this case, I didn't want to lose track of them either. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's like actually one of the big insights of what we, of instrumental is that people underestimate the amount of tracking that needs to actually take place during the research process. And that's where normally people do this stuff on spreadsheets and have like lots of different spreadsheets. But obviously there's a lot of downsides of that. Like it's hard to manage like in you know, institutional knowledge. We hear that people are re-researching things or rerunning the same searches over and over again. And you're looking at all the same funders as opposed to having like a, a triaging system that kind of removes that redundancy. So yeah, for sure, there's a lot of work in between like actually discovering your list of matches and then actually deciding to pursue it. There's like prioritizing and additional research, potentially like relationship building, and that you need a place to actually store that work. Before I let you go here, I'm wondering if you're willing to share a resource that has made the most difference to you in your career? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I'll, I'll say, I'll, can I answer it in two parts? Sure. Um, the first sounds a bit funny or cliche, but I would say one of the biggest resources for me has been my partnership with Angela. And I think having a successful career, like so much of that is just like built on the foundation of having a great partner and a great relationship. And especially in our case, like we actually built a company together. That was like even more true, but that's the first thing that, that comes to mind. And then I would say the second thing is working in a high expectation environment with exceptional people. And I would say that I really got a chance to experience that at Airbnb and just a magnet of like really great, great talent, really smart people, really creative people, optimistic people. And I would say if you're trying to really kickstart your career or like make a pivot or make a move, like putting yourself in a situation where you're surrounded by the highest caliber talent in whatever, you know, space or industry you're in is a great way to like build connections and also see, build your, you know, the AI of your mind on like what great execution looks like, what great operational excellence looks like. Wonderful advice. I love it. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. That was Gory Manglick. CEO and co-founder at Instrumental. Are you as impressed as I am that Gori was successful with her very first startup? It's amazing. So when she shared about surrounding yourself with exceptional people, well, I'm considering it part of the gospel for success. Whatever your role in the field of fundraising research, go visit Gori and her team at www.instrumental.com. Now, it's not instrumental with A-L at the end, just the word instrument, the letter L, dot com. Instrumental has a 14-day free trial, and Gory gave me a coupon code to share with you. Prospect P-O-D-50. Women in tech are shaking up the world, and I'm very thankful that women like Gory are focusing on nonprofit fundraising. Hey, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come check out the Prospect Research Institute's learning community. It's a membership community with powerful resources, great discussions, and comprehensive courses. Check it out at member.prospectresearchinstitute.org. I'd love to have you join me as a member of the learning community. See you there.